Hello, this is the Business of Meetings podcast. I'm Eric Rosenberg. Today, I'm very excited to speak with Andy Sharp. Andy's an amazing entrepreneur who started Song Division in 2003 and evolved into a, a company which is putting those music act worldwide. He is the music partner of uh, IMAX, a hard rock hotel and resort. And Sir Richard Branson said about uh, his company that it's a great company connecting employees and customers using the power of music. Ladies and gentlemen, enjoy Andy Sharp. Andy Sharp, how are you, my friend? I'm well, thank you, Eric. Thank you for having me. It's ah, it's wonderful to have you. And do you remember when we met the first time? We met, well, I think I first saw you when you were uh, president of MPI. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that you had no, to go no, through no. that. So it was, we didn't meet. It was more like you were a, <laughs> you were a celebrity. Yeah, and right. <laughs> it, was, it was in Torino, I believe. Okay. And, and it was the, you know, the opening speech of the EMEC. The, you know, I always thought it was EMEC, but I hear they now refer to it as EMEC, the, the right. European Conference in Turin or Torino. And Marsha and I were there and, 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 and watched you in you were you were the most important person in the meetings and events industry, as far as I was concerned. President, I'm, of- I'm glad you say that because this is recorded and I, I'll be able to share with my wife and my daughter. So there thanks so go. much, Andy. Yeah, but I, I remember I you. <laughs> Sorry? I bear witness to that fact. Right. Yeah. I remember you because we worked together with Song Division. And this remains in my entire professional career one of the greatest moments uh, when we were with a client in New York coming from Belgium and that we had this amazing experience of having the entire company not only creating songs uh, based on their experience in New York the previous days, but performing on the stage of the Hard Rock Cafe in Times Square with the entire company. And, and to this day, when they see the ball falling or when they hear uh, they see a movie about New York, they remember the once in their life they sang on the stage of the Hard Rock Cafe in New York and you and your team deliver. It was just absolutely amazing. It was. Thank you. We, I, I, I remember it vividly and it was, it was, as you remember, it was emceed by Angus Clark, who is some yep. of his U.S. general manager, yep. who, who was the lead guitarist for the Trans-Siberian Orchestra and is currently playing a few shows, well, was playing a few shows with Cher as well. Not too but, bad. Uh, I remember when you when you brought the they were in as an insurance company for an, an yep. incentive trip to New York from Belgium and 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 we led them into a big recording facility and it was a surprise. So the band was setting a band of amazing session musicians who played with all the big stars yes. and they and and you led them in and, and the band who are much better musicians than they are actors, I think. We sort of stop playing going, what are you guys doing here? You're sort of interrupting <laughs> our you're interrupting our rehearsal. And then Angus said, Look, we're just kidding. Welcome. This is who we are. And today we're gonna we're gonna split you into four groups, and each of you is gonna write an original song about this amazing you know, the the, the work that you've done to, to make this incentive trip and this great trip to New York. And you're gonna write these songs this afternoon. And then tonight, you're going to perform it on the stage at the Harvard. Well, actually, they didn't know they were performing in the evening. That was still a surprise. Was it it was still a surprise. Yeah. They did perform in the studio. Uh, they got all the musicians coming together. And it was just amazing. And afterwards, in the evening, we actually walk towards the Odd Rock uh, Cafe on Times Square. And on the marquee, the logo starts flashing. Amazing. We were able to take picture over there. I mean, I'll never forget that. It was just an yeah. amazing moment. So how did you came up with this idea of creating Song Division and, and really changing the industry with that? Well, it's, it's the only idea I've ever had in terms of an uh, uh, entrepreneurial. I, you know, I, get, I am described as an entrepreneur, but it's, I'm, not, I'm definitely not a serial entrepreneur. Um, I was, well, a quick, quick history on, on my background. I was in a band you know, well, I was, in the, I was in the school band playing clarinets and all that sort of stuff, but I was also a piano player and, and I got recruited by like the cool guys who were in a rock band outside of school when I was about 13, 14. And to, because I could play the keyboard. So they said, we need a guy to play the keyboard. So I got grabbed and I was it. And we used to play, they, we play like early U2 and Cure covers, but I, I actually didn't know they were covers. I thought they were 
original songs that these guys had written. And then I'd hear I Will Follow on the radio by you 2 and I'd call them up and go, someone's stolen our song. And they're like, no you're, way. You're, you're an idiot. <laughs> so anyway, I, I, I stayed in that band and then started playing guitar. And I was in that pretty much with that same band of guys from the age of 14 till we were about 26. Um, and we were, you know, from the age of 16, we started playing gigs in pubs and then we got a, a, a development deal with Sony Records when we were about 17. And then wow. we were waiting for the big sort of record deal. And in the meantime, I, I did pretty well at school and I, I, I started studying law at Sydney University um, for a few years. But then, then I got lucky and we got the, we got the record contract from uh, ACDC's record label. So, we, so we, we dropped everything and we headed off to the UK we were right at the start of Britpop, so the whole Blur Oasis period. Um, and we were there for four years and, and in a big, beautiful studio and we sort of played at Metallica, their big album launch and a bunch of different things. But in, in the end, we, we left the record company. We thought we, we, we were some internal struggles with the record company and we, we left them because we thought we'd get a, a better deal. But... Uh, we, we got sued by them and all our visas were tied into it. So it, was, it wasn't the, I, I obviously hadn't paid too much attention during my, my legal classes on that side of, on the music law side of things. So Oish. we we ended up back in Australia and uh, I accidentally got recruited by IBM uh, and I worked for IBM for 10 years and in their global finance. Hold, hold on, hold on, hold on. You're in the band in the UK. Yeah. And then you're going back to Australia. Working with IBM, that, that's back, a very interesting transition. I came back to Australia and and I, with one of my old law friends, he was working at the at the law bookshop. So I started. I thought I, I don't want to. I, I wasn't ready to start another band. I didn't want to work for a record company. I didn't want to finish the law degree. So I thought I'll work at the the law bookshop for a bit and work out my next move. And my girlfriend at the time uh, knew a, a guy who was recruiting for IBM. And we must, I think we were having a drink somewhere and he asked me what my background was and what I'd studied. And he said, well, I, you know, I can get you a job at a good job at IBM. Um, and I, it was such a strange concept. It was such a, I think dropping out of law school to play in the band was a, was a sharp left-hand turn. And then going back to IBM was a sharp right-hand turn. Um, but, I, you know, I was, I was, it was a challenge. So I went back and I enjoyed it and they, they put me through an MBA. And that, that was where I experienced the event world, you know, incentive mm. trips, um, team building experiences, good and bad. Um, and, but, but during that time also, I was still writing songs for pop stars in Australia. And as a result of that, uh, I got asked by Yotha Yindi, who's Australia's most famous indigenous band. Uh, they, they put on a big festival up in Arnhem Land each year. Uh, and as part of that, they will ask usually quite famous rock stars like Neil Finn from Crowded House to come and run some songwriting workshops with the Indigenous school teenagers. Um, but whatever famous person they had that year must have had to pull out. So they called me. Mm. And so I was up there for two weeks where I'd get about, you know, 15, 20 teenagers for about two hours at a time. And we would, I would help them create an original song from scratch. You know, I, I didn't know how to do it. So I had to sort of make up the process on the spot, but it was- Where, where you, you were asked to do that? Yeah. I was just said, you know, you're going to get these kids and can you, can you write some songs with them? Wow. But I wasn't given the manual on how to do that. So, so I basically just asked them um, to tell some stories. You know, what are you into? You're, you're playing football with your grandpa and going fishing with your brother and sister down at the river. And so I'd get them to write simple poems about it. And then I'd ask if any of the kids knew a couple of chords on the guitar and someone would play an E and an A. And then I'd ask them, what, what style of music do you like? Do you like? And they'd say, we, we, like, we like reggae and gangster rap. So I'll say, okay, we're going to do a reggae verse with a gangster rap breakdown. And then we just put their poems to, to a melody. And I, and I had a girl called Peter Morris, who's a pop star in Australia, who had a couple of number one songs in Australia, who has a beautiful voice. And so she would take these poems and just, sing them and so it's it wow. would bring the song to life on the spot and then the kids would sing along so so we you know we're just in the space of an hour or two seeing these kids who didn't think they could write a song to collectively create this piece of music and by the end of it everyone's like we're going to be rich we're going to be famous we and it's that exact same experience that you had with your belgian um client 
in New York, you know, it's that, that same experience, whether you're a 15 year old or a 70 year old, mm. that, that, that joy that you get from creating a piece of music and pretty much everyone is at the end of the process is delusional in terms of I'm going to quit the day job and become <laughs> you know, rich and famous. So I, 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 I mean, to cut to the, the formation of the business, I, I, a good friend of mine in Sydney who uh, ran a telco telecommunications company okay. was aware that I was doing that, had been up into the north of Australia and doing that with the Indigenous kids and said, can you do that with my sales team? And I was, I was a bit like, oh, I'm, I don't, I'm not really the team building guy. You know, like at IBM, you know, it would just get a bit, some of the team building programs can be a bit, bit condescending, bit too bit cheesy mm. um but he was he was a, he was a great guy and, and he kept pushing me about it and i said look I, i'm not a i'm not a drum circle guy i'm not a kumbaya sit around in a circle with an acoustic guitar but what, what i can do is there was 25 of them i can take them into a, a recording studio and right. bring in some of my session musician friends and we can and some beer and wine <laughs> and we can write an original song and they, they you know I, they loved it and i couldn't get rid of them and, and i think i just finished the mba so at that point it was like i think there's a business so that was 2003 and so i i phased out of ibm over the next six months and 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 launched the business so what because a lot of people listening are business owners uh, or are thinking about starting their own business you have a career at ibm you decide to create a company with a concept that nobody has ever heard of. What are your friends, your families, your colleagues, what are they telling you? My, well, my, my, my family, my parents were used to it. I dropped out of law school <laughs> four years, four years into it. So they, they were amazing. They, 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 you know, when I dropped out of law school, they were, they were, you know, they were great. Um, you know, and I'd been playing music since they, they knew that that was a dream since I was 14. Mm. And so I really, at the heart of it, I was more of a musician than an IBM guy, you know, but, that, but by that stage I had that business training. So, uh, no, and, and, everyone, the re and the rest is looking at you like you're cuckoo or no, they, they, no, I think everyone was, everyone was very encouraging about it. I think people, and I still get this, you know, people say, oh, it's a great idea and, and think that the idea was enough to create a business. But uh. as you, as you know, that's just not the case. You know, it's, 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 you, you know, you've got to have a great service or product, but then there's a lot of, you got to build it brick by brick. And so there was the thrill of doing those first couple of sessions and i got some great clients early on, but you know, I think I was pretty much giving them away for free as well. You know, mm. like, so it was not, not with us, but not with us. No, no, I gave you a very special price. Eric. <laughs> but uh, that, that, So it was, you know, it's, it's, um, no, everyone was very supportive, but, but it wasn't easy. No, yeah. So when you say it wasn't easy, uh, you're in the first year, uh, how's the first year? Is it going, is it exploding immediately or you're just wondering, uh, did I do the right choice? Uh, did I make the right choice? Was, what is I, going on? We're, we're, we're 17 years into the business and I, it's never exploded. You know, it's, it's been a very steady, gradual, build the whole time I, I equate song division to a really successful fan by fan built big independent band mm. you know like it's not like a major label where they where they take a unknown starlet and turn them into a big pop star overnight we're more like like a radio head who built over time if i can compare ourselves to radio head that's that's, a, that's don't be too creepy <laughs> boom boom so so it's 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 you know one one client you know in that first year i mean there's you know as an entrepreneur i mean you're an eternal optimist so i've never i've never had the thought mm -hmm. of it not working to this day mm -hmm. it's it's it just doesn't it's never entered my my mindset but you know within the first year we'd had clients like you know three of the four major banks in australia clients like astrazeneca virgin Um, you know, so it was, I, I knew that it had been proven that I, I, I knew what the, the experience of the participants was like and, and how much they got out of it and, and what it meant to the culture of the business going back right. you know, when they leave us and go back to the workplace, the effect yeah. that it has and people were paying money for it. So I knew that that's, that's the fuel that you need. And why this, okay, you say Virgin is one of your clients, but 
were you just lucky that uh, Richard Branson was there at that moment or you did several no, that, gigs for them? We've, had, we've, we'd, we've done quite a few gigs with Virgin. The, the event that you mentioned we did with Richard Branson was, uh, I think it was in 2010. So the, okay. you know, we'd grown by then. And, and that yeah. was um, Daniel Kiri, who was the head of PR for Virgin in Australia, who'd become a friend by that stage. And uh, she, she basically looks after Richard when he comes to Australia. And they were going to do a meet and greet uh, at the Brisbane Virgin Airlines. Um, Virgin Blue is the, is the airline name of the airline in Australia. And mm -hmm. they had a big, big campus up just outside of Brisbane. And there were, I think, you know, three, 4,000 people who were get, there was going to be a meet and greet when, when Sir Richard comes in, flies in, in his helicopter and meets everyone. And he does it every few years. And, and Danielle had called me up and said, look, people, you know, people love him. And, and, and what happens, he turns up and sort of, mm. and these are employees, but he sort of gets his clothes, they sort of tear at his clothes and it's all pretty crazy and, and not everyone gets to see him. So she called us basically saying, is there a way that we can personalise this meet and greet between 3,000 and people and Sir Richard Branson? So the, the concept that we came up with was we, an, an email went out to all the Virgin employees about a month before the visit saying, you know, Sir Richard's coming to town we want, to, we want to make it really special for him. So we're going to write a song for him and, and we're going to sing it to him, 3,000 3, of us, and, and we're going to have help from Song Division, who is you know, some of the best musicians on the planet, and we're going to create a, a, an original song that we need your help with the lyrics. So send in, and we, you know, there's a whole template that we sent out of, of how to submit the lyrics, but send in lyrics about what you love about Virgin. It wasn't necessarily about what you love about Sir Richard because we thought that might be a bit, you know, he's quite mm. humble and shy in his own way. And so it was more about like, what, what does Virgin mean to you? So we got all these amazing lyrics sent in um, and tattoos of, you know, photos of their Virgin tattoos. Like they're pretty hardcore, the Virgin wow. folk. But one of, the, one of the lyrics was, my parents told me I should be a surgeon. I said, no way, I'm working for Virgin. So there was, there was some fun lyrics that came in and, and, and our Australian team turned it into a, like a Barry White slow jam funk sort of song. And then on the day it was, it was set up with a big stage outside and, and, a, and a great band and 3000 people. And, and the band was sort of entertaining the crowd um, while we were waiting. So Rich and I was actually standing behind the stage with the, with the CEO of the Virgin group. So, so he's the founder and the face of it. But there's, as you all know, there's a thousand Virgin companies. It's a very, complicated right. network yeah. of businesses um, and the CEO of the whole group who's, who's actually a New Zealand guy and a lawyer, ex-lawyer who's based in, um, I think he's in Holland actually. Okay. He was very, very, you know, as you'd expect, smooth, smart, lovely guy. And I said, I said, wow, you're, you're the CEO of Virgin. How do you sleep at night? You look like you get good sleep. You know, you look great. And, and as we're talking, you, we could hear the crowd go, this big sort of scream from the crowd, roar from the crowd and, because we were waiting, that Richard was meant to be driven around the back in a limousine and, and I was meant to brief him and lead him out onto the stage. But anyway, he, the limo had dropped him at the back of the crowd and in his own style, he'd walk straight through the middle of the crowd, just full, full rock star entry. Anyway, I, I get sort of taken to meet him right in front of a big cabinet, you know, big speaker stack and the band's playing Long Way to the Top if you want to rock and roll by ACDC and it's, it's a full outdoor concert. Uh -huh. Anyway, they, they bring him over to me and I'm, I'm right up huddled with him, like sort of yelling in his ear, like, hi, Richard, this is what's going to happen. You're going to get lit on stage. They're going to put this guitar on you. Then the MC is going to take over, you know, whatever the brief was. And he turns around to me and he says, and this is, if you might have to bleep this bit out, but he turns around and he says, I can't understand a fucking word you're saying. <laughs> uh, and I said, I just, gave, I just gave him a pat on the back and said, have fun. And he went on, he went on stage and it was, it, you know, it was a beautiful experience. And the, 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 the audience sang the song to him and they had so much fun. And, and, and at the end of the song, and it's like a call and response thing. It's basically going, you know, we love you, Richard, but this, this is what we love about Virgin. And, the, and he, right. went, he went crowd surfing during it. And, wow. Um, so it was a pretty magical experience. But that, that was, uh, yeah, so that was about our you know, our fifth event with, with Virgin at that point. That's awesome. So you, you're starting in Australia. 
And uh, how, how do you um, expand internationally? Is because of your customer telling you, I want to go there? And yeah, do you yeah, have our, any music, musician? How does it go? We, uh, our, our, I mean, I had a decision with the business at the start to go either like to, to go low and wide, I guess, like do small groups and lots of them. So do lots of sort of office team building for groups of 10 to 15. And I guess you could do schools and hospitals and jails and just, you know, like, you know, small, smaller dollar value, but lots of them all go high up the, you know, high in corporate market. Mm. And as you know, doing a small event is just as stressful as doing a larger event. So I, yep. so I chose the, to, to go the high in corporate market and so most of our events that we're doing are, you know, national sales conferences. And in Australia, the Australian population is 25 million people. So it's the you know, population of New York, thereabouts. And so there's only so many of those conferences going on each year. So I was, you know, I was encouraged by people to go and have a look in the States. And I'd actually just been in the States um, with, with my own music and, and a couple of people had said for my, you know, I'm still a songwriter that, that with the business and with my own songwriting, I should go and, you know, check out the U S and I'd spent a fair bit of time in the U S when I was working for IBM. Um, so I actually went over and did two basically free sessions. You know, it's like a chicken or the egg thing. If you're going to work in the U S market, they're going to say, who have you worked with? Um, and so I did, yeah. I did a session with PwC and I did a session with Lehman brothers. Wow. We all know what happened to them. So that was, that was in the uh, start of 2007. And, and I, both sessions went great. And that's where I met Angus. So I, the, the, Angus yeah. was one of the musicians, you know, basically I, I said to the studio owner um, in New York, you know, this is what I'm doing in Australia. I use the best session musicians in Australia. Can you introduce me to some of those sort of guys and girls in the US? And Angus was one of those guys who is still, he's still a, partner of mine awesome. um and but i remember sitting there at the end of the lehman brothers session and the, the their head counsel um there was a, a lady saying if if you can get over here and launch this business you will make millions purely from doing events with um the summer clerkships for the legal firms in new york hmm. so the big, you know the big law firms they're all trying to attract the top students and they and they sort of wine and dine these students, they'll take them to Yankees games. And so her, her thought was, you know, we get 30 of them, take them into, you know, Electric Ladyland Studios, where, which was Jimi Hendrix's studio or, you know, the, the, the record plant, these, these amazing studios in New York. And I was like, what? Well, I'm, sounds good to me. And at, right at that same time, the US and Australia had just signed a free trade agreement. And so I, I was, uh, could, could get a visa based on my, based on my MBA actually and, and work in the US and okay. I think I was, probably, I was probably the first Australian to get that visa um, and so and at that time I'd, I'd met Marsha around there and we were engaged and I'd, I'd dra she was working in advertising and I dragged her into the business and we got married in October August oh my goodness I hope she doesn't listen to this we got married in we got married in August 2008 and two weeks later we moved to New York um, you know and as as we were on the plane, Bear Stearns collapsed. You know, the whole the whole recession oh started, and then and then Lehman Brothers went. So we so we oh launched in the US in, at the end of two thousand and eight, which was as as, as I, before the interview we were talking. You know, we've we've been through some of these cycles before recessions yes. before, and and so you know we're we're to launch in the US at, in two thousand and eight in what what some people perceive as a very fluffy business, you know, getting mm. corporate groups to write songs, mm. you know, was a, was a really key moment for us because the, the clients that were hiring us, you know, about a month after we were there, and we were calling, cold calling people at that point and people are answering the phone going, don't you read? You know, <laughs> there's a, the great recession. There's something happening. Yeah. Right. The great recession has begun, but within, within about a month, um, you know, we were doing events for 3,000 people with, with Nova Nordisk, for example, and State Farm. And, and they were companies that were investing in their people, bringing them together, mm. making their strategy really clear. What do we do, need to do for the next year? And they needed help with that communication and, and, and getting buy-in from everyone and connecting people. And they knew that using music and, and, and our, you know, proprietary techniques that we developed develop work 
That's so, it. so we were, you know, it's viable. And so that was, you know, that was, yeah, 2008. So we've been in the US for nine years. And then around the same time we launched in the UK and, and about five years ago, we launched in Singapore. And the way it usually works is we get, we, we book an event by a, 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 an existing client in another country. And, and mm. then if, if there's more work there, we'll set up a team there. But that's exceptional. So you're now in what, five locations around the world? We have, we have team, like, you know, there's, there's 17 full-time song division employees and they're, they're, they're based in the US, UK, Europe, Singapore and Australia. And then we still have, and then in terms of musicians, you know, we have hundreds of, you know, the top session musicians right. around the world and we, and, and we work in lots of countries. You know, we've, we've worked in, I think, about 35 countries now. That, that's absolutely amazing. And I love the story, uh, not only how you develop the company, but uh, when, when you're arriving in New York and having to, uh, to face a crisis and, and still manage to, uh, to go through it. So you, with your experience there, what is your take on, on the current crisis we are uh, in and what do you think is going to happen? Uh, so... I guess depending on when people are listening to this, the, the current crisis, which is which is a pretty big one, is the is the COVID nineteen um, crisis. And I, Marsha, who's my wife, who's in the business with me, um, she's been we, we've we've done remote sessions sporadically over the years. We actually did we created the the uh, global meetings and events day GMID anthem about five years ago using Periscope with with. I remember of that. Yep. People, so we've been doing it for a while, but but it wasn't a you know a a, 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 a real part of our mm. stable of offerings. And Marsh has been on me for about you know two years, going, you got to get this remote thing going. And so I guess in song divisions world, when this all hit, you know, we, and because it, it's a global crisis, it's the same situation. You know, all all our events got cancelled um, right. or postponed. Um, and so it just gave the whole team, there's a bunch of, you know, you know, a lot of them, smart, passionate, beautiful people. I've got 17 people with their full focus on, on really developing, doing all the R&D on, on a whole different range of virtual offerings that, that work using music. So it's been really exciting. Apart from, you know, apart from the, the, the scary side of things, it's been a real, you know, um, necessities, the, mother of invention um yeah yep. absolutely and absolutely. so we, we we jumped on it very very quickly and and you know and as with everyone's going in the same direction and so we're now doing you know we're doing about two or three remote team building experiences a day uh we're doing happy hours free you know as a community service we're doing happy hours for our uk market us market and, and australian market so we've we've embraced it and you know and i think I've heard people say, you know, be wary of those companies that say this is going to make us stronger, you know, like, cause it's just, they're just saying that to, you know, stay alive at the moment. But I, but I, I do believe that for song division, you know, this time next year, when all the, as you know, all the live events are going to come back with a vengeance. Yeah. We're going to have a whole other um, strong, strong arm of the business with, cause the remote stuff's not going to go away, obviously, you know, like so many companies work remotely. So it's been it's been exciting for us and and, and fortunately within my group um everyone is used to working at home and they they're safe and well that's that's fabulous and and to your point when uh faced with that what, what is it that you can be doing try to be creative look uh other way of, of doing the business uh, are you going to do the uh live karaoke uh over the internet we've do, we we do there is some there is some live karaoke as part of our happy hours and it's part of our rock and roll game show, which is one of our main offerings we've had for years. And uh, there's been some, I, I was probably the least, the, probably the most resistant to, to embrace the lip sync battle, which, which became very popular, you know, through Jimmy Fallon a few years ago, yeah. but, but we do use them at our events and people, people do love them and it still does work in a zoom session. It is, it, it is sort of fairly base popular culture, but it's, but people will enjoy it. So when with you, you said one, one of the topic that you like and that you, you have uh, information to share is personal productivity tips, uh, time management, health. Is it because you're a surfer? 
it, that well, that's part of it. I think I, because I have been working from home, I, I am I am pretty OCD anyway, Eric. I've always been pretty pretty regimented in my ways. Uh, but you know, in working from home for seventeen years, um, I I'm always reading about efficiency tips and and how to get the most out of your day. And then I share that with my team, and I guess that my team encouraged me to do it. I thought I, I didn't want to get too preachy with it, but they but they asked me to share tips. So, so, so now we we're, most of us, or all of us, right now, and to your point, depends when when people are going to be listening to that. But now that we are uh, uh, the end of the the first quarter uh, of 2020, we are all working from home. Um, yeah. So, w- what are the some of the the tips that you you would like to share? for all of us that are working from home right now? Some of the big things. Well, they, they, I think these are big ones for me that apply whether you're working from home or not, I think, if, okay. if I could share them. Um, meditation is a huge part of my day and, and helps me stay happy and positive more, more than anything else. You know, like I, I think, you know, sleep, you, you need sleep. That That's... That's the most important thing. I think you need to, whatever. Some people can do it with six or eight or whatever it is. Getting that sleep, but and and I do exercise every day. I I, I live on Maui. I'm a surfer. I, I I get up at five in the morning. I go down and surf. Um, after I've had a after I've I have I have a one on one call with each of my te- you know seventeen of my team throughout the week. So I, I get up at five and I get in the car and I've got calls down to the beach and then I go for an hour surf and then I'm back on the phone driving nice. home again. But I, I, I do a I do a 40 minute meditation every day, whether that's guided or on my own. And and without going, you know, a lot of people out there love it. Some people haven't gotten into it, but that that makes a huge difference to my life and just gives me energy throughout the day. Mm-hmm. Um, and planning, I mean I, I I on Friday afternoon, and sorry if some of these are a bit too basic. I mean every, everyone's different in how they operate, but I on Friday afternoon before I close off you know I often work on the weekend but but Friday afternoon I look at my schedule for the next week and I live off my calendar and I and I look at the you know three or four most important things that I want to get done that next week and I put them as the first thing in the day on Monday Tuesday Wednesday and Thursday so that I know that my after after my exercise and my meditation the the before I really get hijacked in the rest of the day I've I've you work on the priorities. I've worked on the priorities. And so you're just really, and then each night, and then once Monday hits, I look at Tuesday and I, and I prioritise Tuesday and, and at Tuesday night I prioritise Wednesday and then when it gets to Friday, I prioritise next week. Do you work so on I, weekends? I, I do work on weekends. Not, I mean, for the first 12 years of the business, I'm sure like yourself, I worked, you know, 36 <laughs> hours a day, 15 no, I, I always work part time uh, yeah. from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. <laughs> exactly. So, but it's not not as much as I used to. Good yeah. for you. So, I'd like to conclude the conversation by uh, you painting the picture for the future. Uh, what do you think is going to happen uh, in our industry, and what do you think is going to happen with Song Division? Oh, well, I think with Song Division, I mean, when, when I first started the business, you know, people would say to me, what, what happens when everyone's done, a, you know, they've done the team building program where you write a song? I was like, well, I'll be, I'll be on a big boat somewhere. I'll be rich at that point, you know, but the, the business has evolved over the years, you know, way beyond just being a specific program. You know, our, our purpose is, you know, we unite organisations around their purpose using the science of music. And so that, that, that purpose guides us every day and our, our guys and girls, you know, they, they, they're, they're talking with their clients, hearing about the challenges of our clients and they're solving those, helping solve those challenges with music and they're always coming up with new techniques. So, so I don't ever see that going away. So I don't see the end of the business and part, you know, part of my mission with the business is to set it up as an, you know, you know, it's not a, a, a ma and pop shops is going to stop when I stop. It's a, it's an ongoing business that can really help people. So that's, that's my vision for the actual company. 
um, that we're always developing new programs. I think with technology, and this, this sort of parlays back into what's gonna happen with the industry, and I think we're seeing a lot of it now. I think with, you know, AI and virtual reality, I mean, in 20 years, Lord knows what's gonna be happening in terms of the, the tactile, emotional right. feeling, you know, to, to, to be in another room with someone else. I think, you know, it's gonna be like, the science fiction movies. Um, so I think I think the meetings and events industry is going to keep going down that path. But I I think today still there's a real joy in getting people in in a room together and keeping it really simple. A lot of the conferences. I mean, we do a lot of work in the HR world, and when I go to HR conferences, there's usually two sides to it. There's like all the amazing technology that's happening, and then the need to just really simplify things and get us off the technology and yeah. bring for businesses, bring things back down to what is the purpose of the company? What are the core values? What, what brings fulfillment to our people? Yeah. And, and a lot of that is just old school, not, you know, being together, being creative. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm always confident about the future. I totally concur with that. It's so essential. Uh, um, and we deal with all the technology. I love it. But at the end of the day, people want to meet. And the, the best example we have now is all the, uh, the, the eSports. Uh, people wow. are playing their games in front of their screen. Great. They still want to come in those big arenas to be together and, and share the experience. It's an, it's an, amazing, it's an amazing industry. And, and unless, unless you're in it and there's a lot of people in it, people aren't aware of it. But it's, it's, bigger, than, it's bigger than movies. It's bigger than music. It's, it's huge. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Andy has been a pleasure. Thank you Thank so you. much for taking the time. I wish I would be with you in Maui, although I'm not complaining here in South Florida. So that's great. Florida's pretty good. I'll, I'll come and visit you. You come and visit me. With great pleasure. And I look forward to uh, be able to sing with you again live, uh, maybe on another stage or like we did uh, in this nightclub in Vegas, uh, yeah. but for sure at a, at a future live event. So Thank you so much, Andy. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Eric. What a great story with Andy Sharp and Song Division. I really love the way he's been developing his company, his passion for music, the stories he's been sharing. is a true storyteller. And I'm sure that you, like me, looking forward to meeting Andy in the future at a face-to-face -face event in our industry. Please let me know if you have any question or if you have somebody in mind that you want me to interview. Reach out to me via email, the Event Business Formula Facebook page, or through LinkedIn. Bye-bye.